Can you see that? There we go. You got that? So, everyone, this is a big hippo track, which is very, very interesting. What I'll do is I'll just point it out to you. I always say we need a stick when we are showing, showing tracks. It makes it easier to point it out. So, this is the, the entire track that I've circled. This is a rather large hippo. And this is the back pad, which comes along there. That's the back pad, the whole back pad. And then we've got one toe over here. The second toe. There is a third toe. And that's the fourth toe. So hippos, obviously, they've got four toes. One, two, three, four. And the back pad. And this hippo's been going in this direction. Now, I wouldn't be surprised, everyone, if this is the hippo from Biffle's Hook Dam. We're not that far from it, but we're a fair distance. But I think what what happens is these hippo need to cover huge distances to look for food. They feed on grass generally. At the moment, there's very little around. So hippos can move up to 10 kilometers in an evening looking for food. And this hippo, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the hippo from Biffles Hook Dam that it's been walking around looking for food, probably done a big loop around and headed back to the dam. Um, it may still even be out because it is quite cool this morning. So I wouldn't be surprised if it is still wandering about feeding. But there are other hippo around. We saw another one um, a few days ago, close to a waterhole. It ran off from us, but it was out the waterhole, which was interesting um, during the day because they generally feed at night. But in winter, in winter the, uh, the um, hippos do bask on the banks and lie out in the sun to warm their bodies up. So they will be a bit more active out of the water during the day in winter. But in summer, they prefer staying in the mud wallows or the water holes so they can protect their sensitive skin. Okay, we're going to continue towards Biffles Hook Dam. And uh, I think James has got something tall he would like to show you. Well, there is something tall in the background, but they haven't just spotted something far more delicate very close by that thinks we haven't seen it. Look at the little Steenbok. It's just sort of waking up, lying behind his little log. He thinks he's completely invisible, although you can see he is quite suspicious of us because he is certainly looking this way. Isn't he sweet? And he's not ruminating. Often if they're lying like that, you can see them re-chewing their food. Oh, that's wonderful. Huge ears. All the hair on them, of course, to protect the ears from the dust and whatever else might want to get into them. Giant eyes. And, of course, it's got big ears and eyes in for much the same reason that the big bad wolf had big ears and eyes. Uh, you remember the story, Vim? All the, better to see All the better to see and hear you with exactly well done. He's got quite a bad tick infestation there on the eyes. All right, Byron's got something very endangered to show you, so we're going to leave the sleeping Steenbok and hand you back to him. We do indeed have something endangered, ground hornbills, everyone. Great. I could hear them calling earlier. I'm not sure if you, if you remember that, but I, I said there's a good chance we could find them, and look, we have found them. They were calling earlier this morning. Oh, fascinating animals. Oh, watch how they forage for food almost. They'll go and sift through uh, through foliage and dig up little beetles and even little reptiles if they do find them. There's another one off to the right, just to the right of that one. You might see it. There it goes. And that's a juvenile, everyone. That's a youngster, which is great. So we... I have seen this group before. There are four of them, two adults, and then this really young one, and you can see it's still completely dark. Their face is, um, is completely dark. It's not like the adults where you have that beautiful red color. 
and there is another one that we saw that is pinkish. I'm just going to move forward and see if I can get another. Oh, there we go. There's the other one. I spotted Dave. It's one of the adults again. And there was another one with these that had a slight pinkish coloration to it. So it had just moved out of that very young phase and is reaching adulthood. See how they dig through the dung. They lift up dung and look for beetles, dung beetles, any insects that might be underneath there. And one of the reasons why they are so endangered is they don't have a very successful breeding strategy you know, when it comes to looking after the young also. And because when the ground hornbills mate and the female lays eggs, she only lays two eggs. And usually what happens is the one that is born first, the eldest one, um, that one will usually get more food and sometimes the other chick, the second chick, will die because the first one who gets is a bit older might get more food and then usually the second chick dies. So that's why they only raise one youngster at a time and it's not a very successful breeding, breeding strategy for the ground hornbills and to raise chicks. So it's one of the reasons why they're not very successful. Lacey has asked, how can we tell the difference between males and females? Uh, they're still just walking off to the left, Lacey. Um, I am really not sure, to be honest. I don't know how much sexual dimorphism there is between the ground hornbills. But I'm going to have a look for you quickly. Okay, so I'm going to quickly get my book. I've got, so I use a book and an app, which is quite nice. Uh, but, but I do find for beginners especially, uh, people who are starting out birding, you need to have a book, everyone. Um, the apps, I think, are great to have. But I do think for, for beginner birders, you need to have a book with you. And the reason I say that is because it's a bit easier to to find the birds in a book as opposed to an app. And let me show you. Okay, so this is the ground hornbill. Now, you see we've got, the, yeah, they've got the picture of the male. They don't show a picture of the female. Um, but it's interesting here, you can see the juvenile. Um, that grey, yellow, it says yellow facial skin, that other one was black, so you see again the books, it's a little difficult, um, they don't do the birds much justice, but it is good to have the book around, but what I'll do now then is, I'll then put the book down, and I'll get my app out quickly, and now, uh, this is interesting, there we go, so if you have a look there, the app has got the immature or the juvenile also with that slightly yellowish coloration or dark coloration around the face. It's then got a picture of the male and a female. Now if you look at that, I can't see much of a difference other than it appears as if, and unfortunately you can't zoom on this, but it appears as if that female has got a slightly bluish coloration under her beak. So you see that over there? All right, but then what I'm going to do is hang on a second. And that's distribution, and that says that's an adult male. I think the adult male has got a slightly thicker beak. I'm not sure. This, but yeah, well, this is now a female. So I think the female has got that slightly open area around the throat, just beneath the beak, whereas the male has got that red all the way through. Do you see that? So that's the only difference. Very, very small difference. And you'd have to look very carefully, but that would be it. Um, which is nice to see. Let's just have a look. So this will be a male. Yeah, exactly. So I'm right. So it's exactly that um, under the throat, the female has got a bare little patch, and the male is completely red. So you'd have to look carefully, though. But uh, that is the only difference between the male and female that we can see. And that's another juvenile. You can see that dark 
discoloration or that yellowish coloration around the face. This one that we saw was much, much darker. And after a while, it takes about 67 years for these, for these birds to reach, to reach uh, maturity and the adult plumage. Uh, and that's what their nests look like. They'll nest in, uh, in trees, in massive tree stumps. They'll find, uh, they'll find holes and they'll try and make it a bit bigger and they'll nest inside there. Very, very interesting birds. So that was lovely. Anyway, thanks. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that, you know, I haven't really seen or been able to uh, tell male and female apart. It's not always easy, but it's nice to find these little things that you need to look for. Anna Marie says she feels like she's watching Jurassic Park when uh, when she sees the ground hornbills. They do look prehistoric, don't they? They definitely do. So Rachel, getting back to your question about the Shango names, and James was just saying that the Shango name for the warthog is Hoji. Uh, so I think Judas was close, so Honchi, Hoji, and that's the Shango name for, for uh, a um, warthog, Hoji. So I wasn't too far off, I was close. <laughs> Alright, we're still making our way towards Biffles Hook Dam. I'm going to try to get there a little bit quicker now. And let's see what James is up to and whereabout he is. We've come back to Juma, everybody. That's what we're up to. We haven't seen anything much uh, just yet. But it is a lovely morning out today. And I will just tell you that there is a pack of wild dogs on Biffle's Hook, so we're not going to see them unless they turn south, but what it does mean is that they're in the vicinity, they're around the place, so we might be lucky and they might come back here. We're going to now head up to the northern boundary and head east from there towards Biffle's Hook Dam and see if those lions or perhaps hopefully a leopard hasn't crossed from the north, but without doubt there will be something of interest to see. Now what I really love about this particular area, if you might pan through here, Viam, we're going to have an artistic moment. There we are, this is a glade of, or orchard if you like, of silver cluster leaf trees. And it's a really pretty sort of little forest and the light is always so pretty through here no matter what time of the day you come through. There is, however, one time of year when you do not want to be in this vicinity, and that is coming up soon. That is when these silver cluster leaves flower. And uh, many of you will remember from last year my description of the silver cluster leaves flowers as being like, uh, the, the scent of the silver cluster leaves flowers as being like that of rotting feet. And that is indeed what they smell like, probably because they are pollinated by some sort of carrion-devouring moth or beetle. I'm not sure which, but they really do smell utterly disgusting. There are some impala. Oh, goodness, our cup runneth over them get into a position where we can look at them. I should probably call it in on the radio, you're right, yes. Don't run away, only animal that we've seen today. There it goes. Elegant running. They really are very elegant indeed. And the males, of course, all very excited because, the, well, they're going to be fathers soon the end of next month and possibly before I'm sure probably around halfway through the month the first impala will come I said yesterday I wanted to uh, call the first impala on the 7th of November that being my brother's birthday but 
I think that's going to be probably a little bit early, so I'm still going to stick with the 7th. When do you think they're coming? The uh, 20th was Viams, so you can all guess when you think the first Impala Lamb is going to come. That's not good. There we go. Well done. On we go. And of course they will all be born within two weeks of each other. And that is the way of flooding the market with tiny little baby Impala lambs, 50% of which will not make it through their first year. Shame. It has been a boom, boom year for the predators this year. They have loved the drought. Those Nkahumas have eaten themselves to a standstill. Karula has eaten herself to a standstill, as have her two little babies. She's killed far more adult impala than I've known her to kill before. I mean, she's obviously a very good huntress, but she's been taking out the adults, and I think it's just because everything's just slightly weakened, slightly less aware, on account of the fact that they're hungry. I find myself becoming less aware when I'm hungry, don't you, Viam? Yes, he says. You see, he has to agree with me. <laughs> okay, we're back towards quarantine now, and we're going to turn up Gallego shortcut. Ah, Brent guessed that the woodland kingfisher would come back today. Well, he, uh, he might be right. I suspect he's going to be two weeks early. So I'm going to say no woodland kingfisher for at least the next two weeks. We have had a little bit more rain than we had last year, and whether the woodland kingfisher from his position in Central Africa has figured that out or not, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. So we've had a bit more rain than we'd had by this time last year. And the woodland kingfisher returned last year on the 16th of November. I don't really see why he should come back earlier this year unless he has some kind of word on the wire that water at Juma has fallen. Let's pop past the Galago pan, I think, and just see if those lions aren't there. I suspect they're probably lying still in the same drainage line to the south of the Juma Dam. They do like to spend time there. more impala through there, but uh, they are in thick bush, so we won't worry about that. Now, I must say, for us, the drought was quite fun too, because it meant that there was no vegetation anywhere, which meant that spotting animals was so much easier than it is going to become during the summer months. But summer, apart from the blinding heat, brings with it so many charms, and I was thinking of them the yesterday as I was going for a little run. And the smells, certainly to me, are one of the most special things about the summer. Many aromatic flowers and leaves, sort of these annual herbs that pop out of the woodwork, I nearly said, it's not woodwork, that pop out of the ground. The birds, the greenery, especially the cuckoos, I just love the cuckoo sounds. There's the orange-breasted bushrike, everybody. in the background. There's an apolis, not an apolis, sorry, a tawny flanked prinia. Rattling cysticula. Isn't it gorgeous? And, of course, the white-browed scrub robin. Very, very enthusiastic this morning. Something large through there, but I think it might be a termite mound. Uh, no, it's just a shadow. Oh, well. Then, of course, the other thing to look forward to is the flowering of the leopard orchid. 
of which there are many around here. Maybe we'll have a little bit more success planting one this year. I planted one last year in um, a knot in a knobthorn tree. Unfortunately, it was discovered by a squirrel who then ate it, which I thought was very, very unpleasant of it. Ooh, was there a kill here, Vim? Okay, all right. Something's died around here, everyone's a stink. Um, Dayton, you're in Maine and you were wondering about orchids. Uh, look, the, the leopard orchid is called an orchid, but as far as I'm aware, it's um, not closely related to any of the, I think you call them bromeliad orchids, which are the, the orchids that grow largely parasitically on many trees. I think that this is a, it has a totally different shaped flower. I mean, it just looks like a, a daisy shaped flower. And I, it's not parasitic, it's epiphytic. And that's the only orchid that we get here. And there is nothing drinking at the Gallagher pan. So no, no orchids. You know, no orchids around here. Byron is at Biffleshook Dam, everyone, and he has found the great bachelor of Biffleshook. We have just got you, and, <laughs> and it appears as if we have got the bachelor of Biffleshook Dam. That's Hippo. There we go. Still very happy in this pool of water. This little dam and as i was saying earlier those tracks of that hippo we saw very possibly could have been this hippo that moved around looking for food during the course of the evening and has now returned to rest in the water for for the duration of the day and we did hear that um we've got that update <clears throat> that james also mentioned there's wild dogs on Biffle's Hook at the moment, so just north of us, and it would be wonderful if they decide to turn and come south. That's one of the other reasons why I thought I'd shoot into this area, and um, just see if they do move, if they do come through. Just having a look, there's some birds flying around here, let's see what we can see. We can hear a lot of them, like James has mentioned that, uh, that morning chorus. There's a black-headed oriole calling around here too, somewhere. Diedrich's cuckoo. <laughs> My bird calls are terrible. There's um, Diedrich's cuckoo calling. I'd love to see one. Um... And there's black-headed oriole calling behind us. But a lot of these birds, you can hear them, but you'd think to spot them it would be easy, but it's not. They hide in the trees, and it's very difficult at times. Even a bird like the black-headed oriole, which has got that bright yellow and the black head, but they're just uh, very, very difficult to see. Hang on. Oh wait, we've got a very interesting bird, everyone. Oh, what is this? Just, I just want to show you at the top of that tree, Dave. Can you see that? Let me just turn around a little bit. You can see top right hand side of the tree. There we go. What have we got here? Everyone, I think this is A female Diedrich's cuckoo. Let me just double check for you quickly, but I think I am right. I'm also going to, I'm going to use my book and my app on this one quickly. But uh, I'm almost certain it is a female Diedrich cuckoo. Wouldn't that be great? We've been looking for them. We've struggled to find them. 
<laughs> it is indeed. It is indeed. Look at that, isn't that great? Well, for those viewers who are keen birders, it was a quick view, but we got to see our Diedrich's cuckoo. Wasn't that great? I'm just going to show you in the book quickly. And it's down here at the bottom. Difficult to see the the colours on those birds. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to show you with the app too. I'm just going to put the book down. Let me show. You. This is a beautiful picture of the female Deidre's cuckoo, and that's exactly what we saw. You could see that brown coloration under the throat and the barring, and that very sharp, uh, slightly cur curved beak. Look at that. Wow, so we got to see a DJ Cuckoo. I'm very happy because that's the first one I've seen this season. And uh, we hear them all the time, but they are so difficult to see. But we got to find it, so that's wonderful. DJ Cuckoo, lovely. So I'm sure some of the birders are excited because I know a few of you wanted to see cuckoos. So maybe that's another one for your list. Uh, James has got got some in Yala. I wonder if he's doing his territorial display for them. I didn't want to do a territorial display, everybody, around such a sensitive sighting. We've got a really beautiful little scene going on here, a fairly large herd of Nyalas. And they are just feeding through the drainage line here. That one, of course, is having milk for breakfast, which is uh, very nice if you're a baby Nyala. But slightly on the negative side of the sighting, the lead cow who walked through here and off towards the Galago pan 
was, as Vian described her, looking a little mangy. And I have to agree with him. Then we also saw Waterbuck that was showing those kind of distinctive patches or hairless patches of grey skin. And we wondered if she also doesn't have mange. Now, the, we've spoken a lot about mange. It's not really a theme you want to uh, bang on about for too long, uh, given that it doesn't have very nice implications. But I think there's a bit of an outbreak. Well, I mean, we know there's an outbreak. There has been with the lions. And I think the animals that are nutritionally compromised are really going to struggle going forward. And I think we're going to see it a little bit more. So please do prepare yourselves. Now, it is obviously completely impossible for all animals in an open system like this to be treated for mange. So it does mean that if there is an outbreak, and it sort of kind of gets into most of the populations of animals, well, then it is going to be difficult for us to watch. But that is just the way of things. I mean, certainly none of them look particularly skinny, but they haven't put on a huge amount of condition yet. Uh, as a result of the sort of new green leaves coming out. They're not looking bad, but I have to say I've seen Nyala that look in better condition than these ones. You see the fur there, just not quite sort of, um, not quite as shiny and lustrous as it might be. See there on the neck? Maybe it's just the fact that the winter coat is still falling off, although, no, it's too late for that now. I mean, we're sitting in this Hallow's Eve today. Hello, Wilma. You say, what are the little bubbles on the one Nyala's head? Um, I have to confess I wasn't looking at them. They were probably little horns. Oh, those ones there. That's a young male who's got horns. There we go. They're just the little buds of the horns coming up. There we go. Just getting these horns. No, hang on a second. Yeah, I know that's exactly what's going on there. They are such beautiful antelope, aren't they? And they're being very confiding for us. They're not running away, which is very nice of them. There. Look at that. That's definitely, a, well, I say that's definitely. There's nothing as definite as a guide in the Sabi sand. We're very good at making very definite pronouncements on things. Um, but that certainly looks like a mange to me. But the condition of the rest of the Nyala looks pretty good. I wonder also if it doesn't affect herbivores slightly less than the carnivores. And our beard, I think that you've hit the nail on the head here when you say that, or you've asked the question, does mange get worse in a drought? I haven't read anything about that. It's certainly uh, something that I would agree with. Though. I, I would imagine that mange probably is much worse in a drought year, either because animals are compromised immune-wise because they haven't had enough to eat, but that wouldn't hold true for the lions, and certainly not the Nguhumas. They've eaten a huge amount lately. And, of course, remember when we saw that Birmingham boy who had a, the first real case that we saw, that he scratched his whole belly raw of any kind of hair? That must have been when that was that was in that was before the winter time, but it was at the end of a very poor rainy season, so maybe. Um, but I think that the fact that the herbivores are getting it now, uh, the the effect on them will be made much worse by the fact that they haven't eaten enough. But yeah, I think for some reason the mite that causes the sarcoptic mange uh, has probably managed to survive better in the drought uh, than. Uh, it might have otherwise. I don't know why that should be the case, but uh, that's the only reason I can think that it should be here at this time of the year now. Then there are some waterbuck the other side. There is Mrs. Mangy Waterbuck. And there you can see 
You can see the hips showing. I think she's quite old too. She's also just um, swallowing what she's been chewing for the second time. There are three or four of them in there. One of them's gone up the bank. That's a bull, obviously. He looks okay. Some gaps in his fur. Especially on the withers there, around the shoulders. Hmm. Righty, we're going to continue from here. We haven't got very far from where you last saw us, so let's head back across to Byron, who's got, well, I think the animal that most closely resembles him, really. <laughs> Thank you, James. We've got the buffalo. <laughs> We've got a small little group of buffalo here. It looks like um, a few females. There is a younger male behind us. But, um, um, so they um, have just moved across the main road. What I'm doing is I'm actually on the Buffalo's Hook cut line at the moment, and I'd like to hang around this area because we've got those reports of the wild dog pack that are they're north of our boundary, however, um, north of, of Juma. But... Wild dog cover huge distances very, very quickly. And we've seen in the past, if they do come through, they come through these areas very quickly and we often get a glimpse of them. So you never know. Maybe we're lucky and they do come through. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going to hold my breath, though, but we are going to take a chance and we are going to see if we can show you some wild dog. It would be fantastic to see them. So I'm hoping. Let's see what happens. But for the meantime, it's nice to see these buffalo. And it looks like these ones haven't been harassed by the lions during the course of the evening for a change. Don't see any, any sign of lions just yet. They're possibly still in the drainage lines close to camp. I'm just going to move forward for you a little bit. There's a nice view of that group all standing together. You can see there's all younger buffalo and females that middle sec uh, section of their horn, or it's known as the boss. It's much thinner on the females. We'll see if we can find you a big male and we'll show you. And everyone, I think we are in luck. It sounds like Herbert managed to find the lions. Um, I wonder how close James is. Perhaps James can head towards the lions. And while James heads towards the lions, I can stay in this area and just see if there are any sign of these wild dogs coming through. So I'm not too sure if James is possibly a bit closer. Maybe he can chat to Herbert and then find out, and we'll, we'll give you an update on that shortly. That'll be great. So I wonder where he found them. Like I said, I thought they're possibly in one of the drainage lines close to camp. So it'll be interesting to find out if they are around there. Let's carry on a bit and just see. We're very close to the a cheetah cut line, which is the eastern cut line of Juma. And these wild dogs were in this area. So just north of the boundary, we did get an update from some of the other guides out here. Oh, just some interesting birds again, everyone. Up in the top of this tree, we have the wattled starlings. And they are nomadic. They don't migrate, but they are nomadic, so they do have seasonal movements within Southern Africa. And they've all started to return into this area now. So it's great to see these wattled starlings. Lovely to see them. All right, uh, James has got a larger animal that he'd like to show you. Yes, it is a large animal, everybody, but not the largest version of this animal. 
This is a young bull elephant. And he is, well, he's just feeding on some Zizifus, finding bits and pieces to eat. And much like many of his cohorts, he's putting on condition rather quickly after the drought. I would say that this elephant stands about eight feet at the shoulder. So almost as tall as Brian. And of course, it's nonsense. Brian is not eight foot tall, but about a foot and a half taller than Brian. And he will get a lot bigger in his years. Probably weighs in at about, I'd say, ooh, what should we say, three and a half thousand kilograms or so, which is about 8,000 pounds. Hello, Sandy in British Columbia, and thank you very much for your concern, not for this elephant, of course, but for Brian. Uh, Brian had a migraine yesterday, everybody, and if you've ever had a migraine, you will know that it is an extremely debilitating thing to have. He is fine. The blinding headache didn't last for too long, about six hours, and after that, uh, he was just left with that awful kind of... Um, Aftermath. I don't know if you've ever had a migraine, everyone. If you haven't, you can't really understand it. But if you have, you will know exactly what I mean when I say you cough. And it feels like your brain is going to explode out of your ears. And that's basically how he felt for most of yesterday. But he's okay now. So thank you very much, Sandy, for your concern for our friend Brian and his thumb. The thumb didn't have a migraine. Now, word on the wire, everybody. Oh, hang on, I'll tell you the word on the wire shortly, because this elephant is coming towards us. Now, this is the best, because these young elephant bulls are not exactly, uh, well, they're curious. They like to spend time with us, because they get bored. And you can have a really good time if you're patient with them. He actually hasn't put on that much condition. He's still looking very skinny at the back. And there's a wonderful Afrikaans term for this. Many words in Afrikaans which have no real English equivalents that are really nice sort of descriptors. And um, I'll say it and then Vian will scoff at my accent. But basically, uh, the term skral, which means um, <laughs> skinny, bony. skinny or bony. And it's a wonderful, wonderful term to describe an animal that's just looking like he needs a good feed. How's my pronunciation there, Viem? Oh, oh, good. Viem says it was okay, everyone. Skral. Now, this bull is on his own, and a bull of his age, he's probably, I wouldn't say, much, much more than 18, maybe he's about 20, and often they're with other bulls. And Melinda, you want to know when they start boxing each other for females. They don't box with each other for females by default. They will fight if they are two must bulls of roughly the same age and size and they come across an estrus female then they can often have a very vicious fight um, but that only happens if they're both around an estrus female that they want to mate with then they do play fight they can have quite serious fights over sort of establishing a dominance hierarchy that normally happens in a group of young bulls like this chap would normally be part of and i suspect around here within sort of um earshot if you like but elephant earshot which is a lot further than human earshot there are probably a few other bulls or even a herd and he can probably hear the deep rumblings that they're making around here as we speak which we wouldn't be able to hear they beneath our ability to hear i'm just going to get hold of herbert everybody herbert has found the lions and they're not far from here I'm just quickly going to talk to him while we look at this. Okay, I'm just going to tell Herbie. Copy, thanks, Herbert. Well Herbie, I am two minutes out. Okay. Um, I can just hear Herbert talking now. Uh, I'll keep you 
Okay, copy. I'm coming now. All right, everybody, let's go. Herbert has found the lions, and I think they're moving, which, of course, for our lions at this time of the uh, of this juncture is very unusual. So let's get to them while they're moving. We're going to head towards Central Rose, just down here. It's in Vubu over here. Goodbye, Mr. Elephant. Have a lovely day. I'm very pleased to have met you this morning. Turn Herbert up slightly on the radio. Okay, Herbie, I'm on Mvubu now, um, close to Jumadam. Confirm, I must just come straight down central. You can hear Herbert. Um, there he is. Stand by there by the junction. I'm still driving to see if I'll relocate. Okay, copy. We have Impala running hither and yon. This is the worst patch of road on Juma. They were over it now. We were pretty close. Those lions have hardly moved from where they were yesterday. Still in the drainage where I thought they might be. That's not because I'm good at predicting. Oh dear. Be from there we are. Copy, I'm coming on to central now, Herbs. These lions have been very predictable of late, though. Yeah. Now, there's the dam off to the right hand side. And the drainage line that they've been sort of concentrating their efforts in just off down towards we got driving parallel with it now. Now Herbie will be just in here, I think. While we're looking, them, looking for these lions, let's head back across to Byron and find out how his waiting game for the dogs is going. So it's not going very well, James. I've just got another update from one of the other guides. It sounds like those wild dogs have moved deeper into Torchwood, which is just east of our boundary. Um, so it doesn't sound like they're heading in this direction at all. Which is okay, you never know, they could decide later this afternoon perhaps to start moving this way. So we'll keep our eyes open and our ears to the ground and you never know, we might still get to see wild dog in the next day or two, if they are around. But let's see what else we can find. It's exciting, Herbert's managed to find the lions, so James is trying to work out exactly where they are so we can get to see them. Oh. I saw something small run here, hang on a second, looked like a little dwarf mongoose everyone, let's see if it comes out, uh, it was very very quick and usually they are in groups, large family groups, so I'm surprised I can't see any others just yet. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Well spotted, Dave. There's a little dwarf mongoose. But <laughs> look how well they can disappear into the foliage. There goes another one. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Wonderful. Little dwarf mongoose. Well done. Well done, Dave. There's another one there. There's a squirrel, <laughs> a squirrel that wants to be a mongoose, perhaps. <laughs> uh, so there are quite a few dwarf mongoose running around here. There we go, just off to the left, right here at the bottom. There we go, there it goes. Very, very cute, aren't they? 
wonderful little mongoose. And that's the smallest mongoose species we have in Africa. These little dwarf mongoose. Wow, look how agile they are moving through this, through the ground, or through the little sticks and branches on the ground. It's amazing. So they are very gregarious, always in large groups, large family groups. Um, dwarf mongoose, you can possibly get in group sizes of up to 10 to 20 of them. The other species of mongoose we get out here, which are very gregarious, are the banded mongoose. And the banded mongoose, I've seen groups of up to 30 or 40 of them together. They're much larger, and they've got stripes over the back. And uh, But these little dwarf mongoose are very, very cute. And they do get a little bit more curious than the other mongoose. Sometimes they'll come and have a look at you, and they'll stick their heads out of a, um, a, a pushed-over log that they've possibly wandered into and they'll come and have a look and then return back in again or out of a termite mound often they will use a termite mound or abandoned termite mound so the interesting bird here what was that let me just move forward everyone just so i can see what was that the babblers Oh no, wait, what is that? Hang on. Top of the tree. Is that not a... Oh wow, everybody, a honey guide. Can you see that at the top of the tree? A greater honey guide. Oh, fantastic. Don't know when last I saw this bird. And it has got... Oh, I thought I heard him. Sneaky little honey guide. And I've got some great stories for you with this bird. Just going to try to find it for you. And this is the one that we saw. There we go. The greater honey guide. Look here, right in the top of the corner of the page. That was it with that slightly reddish beak, pink bull. A bit of white and the black. And it's still calling. It's flying in front of us. Now, uh, the honey guide. Oh, this is wonderful. Now, I've got such great stories about them. And let me just forward, go forward again. Let me try to show you it because it is still just ahead of us up at the top of this tree. There he goes. Just hold on a second for me. Somebody's just trying to get hold of me on the radio. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Just see, I don't know where that bird has gone now. Copy that, Lex. I'll do that. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so um, that honey guide seems to have moved off. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start driving towards Cheetah Cut Line. It sounds like the wild dogs have been moving around a bit, and I'm not too sure there's... No sign of them heading in this direction just yet, but they are split, they have split up and they're running all over. We might still get a glimpse of them, so I'm going to head towards that area. But in the meantime, let me chat about that honey guy. That is really, really a wonderful bird to see. And, and one of the stories I remember, and Judas, uh, my friend and tracker that I used to work with, he, to, he used to tell me wonderful stories about honey guides and a lot of the belief with the Shangan culture. Um, and this actually does happen. It, has, it can happen if you follow a honey guide. And they've got this wonderful call and that call that it was doing uh, over there, it wants you to actually get out and follow it. And these birds do in fact lead you to beehives. So when you get there, you'll usually find the honey and honey badgers do follow honey guides. And these honey guides will lead you to the, uh, to the um, beehive 
or to the ne nest where the where the bees are and what happens is the honey or the honey badger will break open the tree bark or the stump where the bees are and then by doing that the bird is able to feed on some of the bees and some of the honey and the honey badger gets the honey but uh, Judas would tell me the story and the belief is that if the honey guide led you to the honey You'd always have to break it open, take some honey for yourself, but you would have to leave honey out for the bird to say thank you that it led you to that honey. Because he said often if you didn't do that, the honey guide would remember and it would come and take you and lure you to what you thought was a, another a beehive, but it would in fact lure you towards a snake hole where there'd pro probably be a black mamba waiting. So he said, whatever you do, if you follow a honey guide and you get to some honey, leave some honey for the bird, and it will, uh, it will then be thankful and lead you to honey again the next time. But they've got a wonderful call, and I know my bird calls aren't great, but it sounds like it, um, they are saying, Victor, 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 Victor. <laughs> that's, that's the greater honey guide call, and then it also does that call. So while I head towards Cheetah Cut Line, James has managed to find those lions. I don't know where Byron got that information from. There's no lions here, everybody, just that leopard orchid, which of course has not flowered yet. There it is. Apparently very sweet tasting. You'll read. Uh, then when you taste them, you realize that they're not sweet tasting in the slightest. Oh, goodness, Viam, what's that over there? It's a lion. We are with the lions. Herbert found them, and they are in exactly the same place that they were the last time I saw them at this time yesterday. There's a pan off to the right-hand side. That's one of the males, Tigno, and he, of course, is the consort of one of the females. The rest of the pride is over there. And they're all lying down next to this water where they have been for the last 24 hours or so. This is not a pride of lions that likes to overexert itself by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> yes, they like to have a very relaxing time of it. Now we'll try and get a little bit closer to those cubs, assess their physical condition find out if they are recovering from their mange or if it is getting worse. And they remain, to my mind, by far the cutest animals out here in the wild. Clay, we don't know the answer to your question, to be honest. You've said, what causes a mange breakout? How does it thrive? Well, it, it is spread from one animal to the other by direct contact. And it's caused by a little mite that digs into the skin. And it's the same mite that causes this human skin condition called scabies, which is a very sort of um, unpleasant situation where, you know, if you're a human being with scabies, you get these kind of extremely crusty, itchy pieces of skin, and the same thing happens to the lions, and eventually it can actually kill them. But it's by no means a death sentence. Why? Why it's out here now, and why it has, um, uh, you know, why there's an outbreak now, I think it's too much of a coincidence to say that, you know, there's a drought at the same time, and it's purely coincidence. I think there's something to do with the, the drought, but I don't know exactly why it should be the case. Right, that fellow, oh, there we go, is now asleep. That's quite a nice shot, that. <laughs> Darlene, a very good question from you. You want to know how mange goes about killing an animal. Well, Again, it's difficult to say. I think what happens in, in young and infirm animals is that they eventually scratch all the hair off themselves. And when that happens, they become cold, they become weaker, it becomes difficult for them to move around and feed because they're so obsessed by this 
tremendous skin irritation. And I think that eventually probably creates secondary infections. I don't know that the mite itself actually would ever kill an animal, but I think it probably creates a situation of weakness, immune suppression, and then secondary infections and other parasites will eventually kill the animal. I think that's how it works. There's another female in there. Let's try and move around a little bit and see if we can't get a slightly better view. As the red-chested cuckoo calls in the background. And yes, Dayton, I think that you're, you've made another good guess. You say, is it possible for an animal to contract mange or a predator to contract mange from eating an infected prey species? I think yes, absolutely that's possible. I don't see why it wouldn't be. I think this, I don't know where the Birmingham boy got it from. We'll just have a quick look here. I don't know where that original Birmingham, Birmingham boy got his mange from, but I think he's the one that's given it to everyone else. And we think it was Tignor, but are we stand to correction there. So it may have been this fellow himself that we're looking at. He doesn't look particularly concerned about it, does he, Viam? No. He looks particularly disinterested, in fact. That is a picture of absolute blissful peace, everybody. <laughs> and then just to the right hand side of him we could just see the top of the female's body and he will only move when she moves the only reason he actually sat up was because she sort of started to move around a little now let's see if we can see the rest of the pride Try not to fall into this pan as we go past. There we go, we've made it. Now, I don't know how long we're going to spend with these chaps. It very much will depend on you, everybody. But I think if they're not doing too much, then we probably won't sit here for too long. But here, in the drainage, are three little cubs. Let's try and assess their condition. There we go. One, two, three. There, that slightly worrying scratching is beginning on a seemingly unaffected one. And always behind the elbow to start with. That one looks all right. Doesn't seem to have any patches. And then what we need to check is that one there, because I think that one, if there is a lion that is, if there is a cub amongst this group that's suffering a little, it's probably this one. No, maybe not. Maybe just having a, a bit of a clean, no, that's definitely a mangy foot. Yeah. This is a worrying, I must say, everybody. But like I said yesterday, not a death sentence necessarily. They are eating very well, so they have the best possible chance of surviving this. Hello, Leilani in California. You're wondering at what point these little lions will become adults. She's looking there at the red-chested cuckoo. 
They become adults, Leilani, when they are, well, I suppose they re the females reach sexual maturity at about two and a half years, and they can mate from then and have cubs. There's the bird, the red-chested cuckoo. And the males, well, yeah, that's a wonderful picture of a red-chested cuckoo. Oh, that's wonderful. Leilani, the males will reach sexual maturity a bit later, about three, three and a half. But they won't mate until they're probably six normally when they take over a pride. But they'd be considered adults from three and a half. Or three even. Isn't that cool? Now that one, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not mistaken, this bird parasitizes starlings. I'm just going to quickly check that. Which means it'll be looking for virtual starlings, I think probably specifically, which are roughly the same size. Oh, interesting. It says uh, primarily the Cape Robin chat, but you don't get the Cape Robin here. But about 15 other species, I'll just check what those are. Cape Robin Chat. Well, there are no Cape Robin Chats here, so oh, here we go. Hosts. Thrushes, Robins, Wagtails, White Throated Robin, Bearded Scrub Robin. It could easily be, I'm just reading this, of course, from my bird app. It probably then is the um, uh, White Browed Scrub Robin that that red chested cuckoo is going to parasitize. No starlings, interestingly. A new scar. Yes, look at that. That's a scratch. That's interesting. A new scratch. Quite possibly from the male. There was quite a lot of conflict yesterday. Let's see if he doesn't get up and follow her. Quite a lot of argy-bargy there was yesterday going on. Every time one of the males came near one of the other males, he got very upset. But I don't see the other male here. <laughs> Still the cuckoo calls. I believe Taylor tried desperately to get that cuckoo on screen yesterday. Um, <laughs> but they are very elusive. Yeah, that licking is definitely goes well beyond cleaning, I'm afraid. That is now full blown scratching as far as I'm concerned. Shame. All right, let's move around there a little bit. Nia, you're in Illinois and wondering about FIV, feline immunovirus, uh, which is much the same as human immunovirus, but for cats. And you're also wondering about TB and how much there is around of each disease. Um, FIV, I've heard, is not quite as dire as the situation is with the human immunovirus, so it doesn't seem to do quite as much damage, although my mother's house cat died of FIV. She was very upset. Um, but tuberculosis, you'll probably find, especially given the amount of buffalo that these lions eat, I think you'll find that TB is uh, rife amongst them. But because they are not immune compromised at the moment with things like FIV, um, they are actually okay. You'll find it doesn't express and doesn't cause a problem unless they don't eat enough, unless they really struggle to find sufficient to eat. Now we're quite close to these lions. There's one just behind a bush here. So I need to be a little bit careful. We'll just stop here for a while and let her get used to us.
Uh, not that she's likely to react at all, but if I do go any further forward, I'm going to make a loud crunching noise. Still trying to suckle, so we've got one, two, three, four, four lionesses. So the other male and the other female, look at that, probably away with each other. Just be able to hear the little cub calling. Isn't that a ridiculous sleeping position? That's the chin spot bat is calling. She is very comfortable having a bit of a suckle. Can we get in close on the foot on the tree there, then? <laughs> no, not really, because I haven't parked you properly. <laughs> Hello, Maggie. We're watching that lioness with her claws stuck in the tree. And you're wondering if they can climb trees. They're highly adept tree climbers, Maggie. They're able to climb trees very well. Uh, not quite as elegantly as leopards, but that's just a function of the fact that they're much heavier. But they can climb. I've seen them sleeping in trees the same way that leopards do. They don't do it as often. Remember, a leopard spends most of its time in a tree, A, for security, and B, to stash its kills. And there's no real reason for a lion to do either, because very little is going to try and steal a kill from a lion. And also, um, they just are very confident. They don't need to worry about anything attacking them. So I don't think that there's any kind of um, need for them to climb as much as leopards, and so that's why they don't. Yeah, you know, all of these cubs are now looking a bit mangy. Shame. Anyway, that's nature. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, isn't that wonderful? And exactly like when Jamie had amber eyes doing that to one of the cubs. That's an aunt. That's not a mother. She's not one of the mothers, but she's taking on the responsibility of being affectionate to the little ones. She's enjoying the company of the little cub and giving it a little hug. That's very sweet. And back to chewing the mangel for a foot. It's obviously very, very itchy. I think what also happens with this mange is that these animals become consumed by dealing with the itch. They're unable to do anything else. You see, the cubs are not playing. I mean, look, they're getting a little bit old now for too much playing. <laughs> but I wonder if a lot of their playtime is now being taken up with scratching and licking and biting. <laughs> And Louise says they were playing a lot yesterday afternoon, so maybe I'm talking rubbish, which I hope I am in this particular case.
One of the most common questions we're asked out here is about the role of males in the upbringing and protection of youngsters. And it's because I think we as human beings are so, well, I mean, we have almost a unique relationship with our fathers. Uh, some of the birds have a very similar relationship, I think, but very few mammals have the same kind of relationship with their fathers. And Marlena, you're wondering about male lions and how they, um, if they're affectionate with the youngsters and if they protect them. The short answer is n no on both counts. Yes, they can be affectionate, but they will seldom approach the cubs where the mothers do. If the cubs approach the males, which sometimes they do, um, the male, ca it's very sweet to watch. The male often sort of just lies there, sort of looking like a slightly irritated but patient father. And then he might give him a bit of a swat and tell them to go away. But yes, they, so th then there is, and it's, it's always such a treat to see that because it doesn't happen all the time. It's not very common. Do they protect them? Yes, indirectly they do protect them because they protect the territory from marauding other males which would almost certainly kill these cubs then yes what happens is that I suppose you could say they protect them do they act as security would they, I mean is that male that we saw lying around here in order to look after these cubs absolutely not would they share meat with the cubs absolutely not so they are they are very they play a very different fathering role uh, compared with say human fathers do It is a fascinating question, that, and one that um, the closer I think you get to um, the closer you get to to us up the sort of uh, I guess you call it the evolutionary ladder, although it's a very poor poor way of putting it. Um, in other words, the, the you know the primates, the great apes, tend to have a much more active parental role, although it's really not a big one, the fathers. They very seldom have a huge role at all, and it's really in the birds where you find the greatest involvement of fathers in the upbringing of the youngsters, and it's no coincidence, of course, that birds lay eggs. They don't get pregnant, which means the males can have a much more active role from the beginning. So that's quite interesting. Let's head across to Byron and find out uh, if his dogs have crossed the boundary. I suspect we'd be heading there a lot faster if they had, but he'll tell you if they're getting close. So unfortunately, no wild dogs. And just got an update from the other guys again. It sounds like they've headed all the way into the Kruger National Park, so west. Uh, sorry, east as opposed to west towards us. But we did find this beautiful giraffe, a female giraffe, happily feeding away. And that, uh, that's often the case when it comes to the wild dog. You know, they move and cover huge distances. They have very, very big territories. And they can cover up to 10 kilometers in one morning very easily just by running around looking for food. And that does happen then. But you never know, they could potentially be back again sometime soon. So hopefully we will get to see them. And look at this giraffe feeding on these knees. It's amazing. I love watching them feed because if you have a look at their tongues, it's very interesting. And you'll see this tongue every now and then being stuck out. And sometimes they actually use the tongue and they wrap it around a branch and they pull the leaves off. These are large leaves, so it can feed with its, just with its lips. There's the tongue, do you see that? The tongues are almost 30 centimeters long. Big males, the tongues can get up to 45 centimeters. That's a long, long tongue. <laughs> this giraffe is just eating non-stop. The interesting thing, though, the giraffe are also ruminants. So they've got that four-chambered stomach. So, so, so what happens is while they're feeding, they just like the antelope and cattle, they've got this four-chambered stomach. They eat, they swallow the food. It is then mixed with enzymes in the stomach, in the first chamber of the stomach. 
And what they do is they then regurgitate that. And with the giraffe, you can actually see, it's known as the bolus. It's that piece of food that comes back up that they rechew. That ruminants rechew and it comes back up the throat. And you can occasionally see it on giraffe because of the long neck. You can see this bolus come back up and then they'll rechew and they'll continue to chew on that for a while. And then swallow it again and it passes through the rest of the, the body. I know some of you were wondering, am I going to uh, get out the vehicle again like yesterday and see if this giraffe is as curious and watches us? And Nina's wanted to know. Um, Nina's, I, you know what, I don't think I'll do it today. And the reason is sometimes we can disturb the animals a little bit when we are on foot. And... Wow, look at that. She's stripped the leaves completely off that branch. <laughs> so Nina's, uh, I think what I'm going to do is leave this giraffe so I don't disturb it. Leilani, all the way from California, loves giraffe. And she says she's so happy that we got to see one. And I'm so glad that we can show it to you. They are beautiful animals. They really are. There's just something about giraffe that, um, that I find fascinating. And it's so funny. People often ask me, you know, what is the animal that, that people want to see the most when they come out on safari? The guests always have their requests and say, oh, you know, we really like to see lion or really like to see leopard. But one that does come up very, very often is giraffe. A lot of people want to see giraffe and it's, uh, it's a beautiful animal to see. And it is so strange. You see these very tall animals walking about feeding on all these leaves. And David wants to know, because these giraffe have got such long necks, are they able to see each other from long distances away? David, 100% right. You are correct. And that's probably why this female is by herself. Usually the females tend to, to move around in small groups. Now I think all that's happened is there might be some others around that we possibly can't see, but they can see each other. And that height advantage definitely plays a huge role in that so we'll spread out and then uh, and meet up with each other from time to time but uh, but usually if they are in an area they can see each other they can see where the other giraffe are so it does help David you can hear some buffalo grunting in the distance um, it's quite faint, but not not an alarm call or distress call or anything. Just a, a herd grunting, possibly a, a male chasing a female or, or some buffalo males getting aggressive with each other. It's <laughs> the sound of the buffalo, I think. <laughs> Clay all the way from Oregon wants to know. Oh, can okay, you hear those buffalo again? Again, I don't think it's. Sorry, I'm just listening. No, I don't, it doesn't sound like distress calls. Clay from Oregon wanted to know how many giraffe are there in the reserve. So it's very difficult to tell because, um, and we mention it a few times. The we are situated in the greater. Kruger National Park. This area is around 7 million acres of land, so it is massive. There are plenty, plenty animals spread out, and these animals can move wherever they want. There are no fences prohibiting them from that. 
there is obviously just a perimeter fence, especially closer to villages outside of the game reserve. And uh, that's to protect the animals and to protect the people outside. But within the park, there are um, thousands of animals and there are probably thousands of giraffe. I would not even begin to know the exact amount of giraffe in the, in the Greater Kruger. Got a question from can't we be civil <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question is where are the mammary glands for the or the teats on the giraffe and are they up front like the elephant or at the back they're actually at the back so they're between the back legs so the giraffe calf will suckle from the back and not situated up front wonderful gate and that's uh, the gate is the walking style that the giraffe have the, the two legs on the right side move together and two legs on the left side move together oh, that was lovely lovely surprise bump into a giraffe Tranquility wanted to know if I think this giraffe is pregnant. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, you did mention that the belly did look a bit round. It's a possibility. And there's a possibility. I'm just having a good look now. And I might see it through there. Let's have a look. Sometimes tricky to tell. It is a p possibility that this female's pregnant. Her belly is f is quite round. So who knows, we might see a little giraffe running around in the next few weeks. Wouldn't that be wonderful? They're very, very cute when they're young. Oh, there's so many birds calling at the moment. It's a cacophony of bird calls. We've got hornbills calling around. There's a orange-breasted bush shrike. There was a chinspot battus. A chinspot battus has a wonderful call. It sounds like it's saying three blind mice. And, and <laughs> James might argue um, with with me on that one, <laughs> but the call and. Uh, sounds like three blind mice the chin spot batters and I heard one calling earlier I'd love to show you one of those they are beautiful little birds very small and a loud call for such a for such a small bird So let's carry on going. And James wants to know what is my favorite cuckoo species? Uh, favorite cuckoo species, James? Uh, sure. I think it's a, uh, I think I'd say that red chested cuckoo, James, and uh, I, I really enjoy the call. That no, that's <laughs> really Beat my throat. Beautiful, beautiful call. So I do enjoy the cuckoo. That's my favorite uh, cuckoo species and my favorite bird call. Yeah, what is my favorite bird call? That's tricky. Um, I mean, the African fish eagle 
is wonderful. It's got a beautiful call and have a look everybody. Zebra, yay. <laughs> this one's great. Nice surprise, bump into some zebra. So we've seen some zebra and giraffe. Quite a thick little area that we're in at the moment. Uh, James, you know what? I do know one of my favorite bird calls. I've, I've probably got, <laughs> I've got, I think I'd say three, three that I really enjoy. And two of them are owls, actually, little owls. And the one is the pearl spotted owl. Let me see if I can find them for you quickly. But the pearl spotted owl has got a, a beautiful call. And you hear them in the evenings in the bush felt. You can hear them calling. And the pearl spotted owl, hang on, let me show you where that is. There we go, it's a tiny, tiny little owl, this little one over here. You see that? Very, very small little owl. Look at the black markings on the back of the head and the eyes. So they've got a great call, and their call sounds like this. It is an amazing call and it sounds just like that and you can sometimes and I have been able to do it once or twice where I've called and this little owls come to inspect and have a look around so the pearl spotted owl is one the other one is this lovely little scops owl this beautiful little one over here African scops owl and that's got a beautiful call too and you hear them but they call non-stop at night but this is different this there's, there's Sounds like he's going, kur, 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 kur. and they do that constantly, but for for hours at times. A beautiful little scop sound. But um, one of my favorites is the uh, what's it called? <laughs> I've had a blank. The black crowned shagra, and they've got a wonderful sound. The black crowned shagra, you'll often hear them, and they they often sound like this. They've got this wonderful sound, this kind of melodious up and down call, which is, it really is wonderful. And that's probably my favorite call in the bush is the black crown chagra. I love hearing them, but very difficult to see. Often they fly very quickly in through the thickets and they stick low down to the ground. All right, we're gonna have a good look around these thicker areas and see if we can't find any predators hiding around here. And while I do that, James is still with the lions. Let's see what they're up to. Now, everyone, we are going to spend uh, just a few more minutes here because the lions are settling in for their daily sleep of 20 hours or so. They have done almost nothing since I last saw you. Uh, Bar harassed this poor female there who seems to be still lactating. She's probably the mother of the very little ones. I've done a little bit more of an assessment of the mange situation. It's not good. And it's going to be difficult to watch if it does just start to progress like it did with the Styx Pride. I think this is the worst affected one there on our left. Hello, Shah girl. You're a new viewer, and it's lovely to have you with us. Thank you for talking to us, and thank you for getting hold of us, and thank you for watching. Uh, and please tell everybody you know about it, even people you don't know. Just tell them about Safari Live. Um, 
Shargal, you want to know if veterinarians or would ever get involved in a situation like that, if in like this, if a disease became rampant? And the short answer is, in an area like this, it's almost impossible because of the size. We're part of an eight and a half million acre or three and a half million hectare wilderness, and that means disease travels as freely as the animals travel around here. So were we to bring a vet in to fix this main problem in the pride, yeah, they'd probably pick it up again almost straight away from living in this area. But the other thing to say is that because it's a wilderness area, we try and have as little effect as possible on the animals. So we try not to interfere with nature. Now, yesterday we had a question about whether or not lions are endangered, and surely with an endangered species like this, we should be helping them. Well, they're not officially classed as endangered. Uh, they could, there were certainly arguments for classing lions as endangered, but in South Africa, the southern African lion, which is what we're looking at here, has a very stable population that goes into the Kruger, it goes north into Zimbabwe and east into Mozambique. They have a stable population here, and that means that we won't get involved. If there were wild dogs, for example, and they had rabies, uh, or there was an outbreak of rabies, it is entirely possible that we would try and inoculate them against that disease. And that, of course, is because wild dogs are severely, severely endangered. There are probably fewer than 3,000 left. We don't know how many lions there are left. Uh, we do know for sure that their numbers are dwindling and that they are threatened absolutely. But in this particular part of the world, they have a stable population. Now, if all of these cubs die, which is possible. We don't think it's going to happen, but it is possible from the mangy disease that they've got. It is unlikely that that would change the lion population much because these females will come into estrus almost straight away. They'll breed again and three months later we'll have more cubs. Now that's a fairly heartless way of looking at things, but sometimes we have to be able to look at things like that because you know 90% of the time when we as humans get involved in natural systems, we make a mess. We create tragedy, we create a problem. And that's why for me, although it is really difficult to watch lions and any other animals suffering from any kind of disease, it is often the best approach just to let things be because nature has a way of sorting itself out. So please do understand that in the next few months, while we're watching these lions, if they are, uh, if they do start to get sicker, and if they do start to lose all their hair, like the Styx Pride like, uh, cubs did, it uh, it is not because we are being um, callous or cold-hearted about it that we aren't doing anything. It's because we truly believe that the best approach here is to let things take their course. So don't for one second think that you are sort of watching in um, sadness alone. It will be us with you. High movement there. You can see that she's turned round. And yes, Anna Marie, as they get older, I do think that their chances of survival will get much higher. That said, the Styx Pride cubs, which all died, um, they were all older than this, or certainly, no, they weren't all older, but there was a cohort of them that were probably a good two months older than the oldest cubs here, and they all passed on, but they weren't eating. Their mothers seemed to be really struggling to provide for them. They seem to be always hungry. These guys are eating almost every night. And that's going to make a huge difference to their ability to fight the disease off. All right, everybody, I think that we should pack it up here. I think we should go and spend a little bit or the last hour or so of the drive uh, out looking for one or two other things just simply because these lines have settled for the day and I think it's probably a nice idea for us to go off and see what else we can see. Okay, we'll come back here during the course of the afternoon and see what they're doing. Uh, that's just simply because they're not going to do much. Right, here we go. We're now going to try and extricate ourselves from here. We'll have one last look at the mail as we go out.
We don't, of course, have a spare tire on Jigger at the moment. Jigger's got a small problem with carrying a spare tire. There's the old bat that she is. So we don't really want to pop a tire and call what VM <laughs> terms Connor roadside assist. We don't want to call that in the middle of a lion sighting. Do we, VM? No. no. Connor would enjoy it, yes. Lorena, a very nice point from you. You say you understand what I'm saying about letting nature take its course, but you say nature doesn't always work. Species go extinct every day. Let's have one last look at this male line while I answer this query, because it's a good one. Lorena, who's to say that... Oh, sorry, quickly, Byron's got a bird. Do you indeed have a bird? Had a bird? <laughs> Hang on, they might come back. European bee eaters, everyone. Let's just see where they are going. Oh, they're all, all over. They're, they're possibly still one or two around. Hang on, just stay with us a little bit. See if we can't get you another view of them. What's sitting up there? Um, There is one at the top of that tree, Dave, but it's a little bit far. But you got him there. That's a European bee eater. Well, at least you get to see it, everyone. There's a whole bunch of them around here earlier. Oh, we're having a great morning with our birding. So, mm, lovely. I don't see the others seem to have moved off. But the European bee eaters do migrate and all the way to Europe, hence the name, the European bee eater. But I'd like to show you, I'm actually going to show you on my app because the colors in the book don't do them any justice. And um, there's a gray go away, go away bird calling just off to our right, it's making a bit of noise. Let me show you this European bee eater quickly. And look at those colors that you can see and I'm just going to scroll and show you the pictures there look at that isn't that a magnificent bird really very very beautiful vibrant colors all these bee eaters are very colorful but these European bee eaters are incredible to see so that's what we saw you can see that yellow throat but again with the light at the moment um, the it's very difficult to to actually see all the colors in the birds because we've got this very dark gray background with the sky and a lot of clouds so it's um it's very difficult to see the colors and i can hear another bird calling it's a black cuckoo i'm just going to drive forward a little bit and see if you can hear it it's got a wonderful call and that cuckoo will also call continuously they they i've been near black cuckoos calling for two hours and then they don't stop. Hang on, here we go. You might be able to hear it from here. There's a lot of bird life, bird activity at the moment. Okay, listen, and it sounds like it's saying, I'm so sad. Could you hear that, everybody? Could you hear that too? I wonder if he'll come and inspect. Maybe my black cuckoo call isn't as good as I think it is. <laughs> but it's lovely. It's a wonderful, wonderful call. And they describe it in the book saying it's I'm so sick or I'm so sad. I don't think uh, I'm so sad. Um, let me show you a picture of the black cuckoo quickly. Uh, I do enjoy them too. I enjoy that call. There we go.
that one you can see completely black a bit of white barring underneath the tail but um but a beautiful beautiful cuckoo a lot of bird life around here at the moment which is great it's nice i do enjoy the birding i think it's a very important part of being on a safari because the birds uh, the, the bird life around here is just so fascinating to see. And we've got some wonderf wonderful, wonderfully coloured birds. Um, you know, beautiful colours, vibrant colours out in Africa. We've also got uh, birds, which uh, there's a dung beetle that was flying next to me. And we've also got uh, some birds that are very dull and very difficult to identify. But uh, the bird life, I think, is very, very important to appreciate while you are, are out on safari. It's nice to see all of them around, and especially now going into summer. All these mi migratory birds coming back. And I just heard another interesting one that I probably will be able to show you. Yeah, there he is, right at the top. Just jump there, Dave. Did you get him top right? There it is. It is a crested barbet. I oh, just moved up a little bit. There we go. Out in the open now. Beautiful yellow and black. And look at him calling. Listen to that. You can all hear him. Wonderful. The crested barbet. B B A R B E T barbet. How beautiful birds. And there it goes. Lovely, wasn't that nice? A beautiful, beautiful bird to see and wonderful to see it calling and hear the call. All right, well, it, um, so I'm glad I got to show you those birds quickly. We're gonna carry on driving around, just seeing what pops out and anything interesting that we are able to find for you. Uh, let's head back to James and see what he's doing with the lions. I've come, everybody, to the magpie shrike nest that I think Taylor found. Was it Taylor? And she saw some chicks in it yesterday. Shall we go back a little, Pimpy? I think it may be better there. Now, Lorena, your question to me, which while we look for these shrike chicks, your question was, sometimes nature doesn't work. I mean, species go extinct all the time. And my comment to you, let's just see if we can't hear something there. My comment to you is to say, who is to say that nature isn't working when animals go extinct? Environmental conditions change all the time, and uh, you know, species go extinct all the time, and new species evolve all the time. And that is just part of what happens. You know, there are climatic changes, there are geological changes, there are huge changes that happen. Uh, the fact that we don't have dinosaurs anymore, of course, is a function of the fact that uh, there was a natural change. I mean, we think they were wiped out by a giant meteor strike. May or may not have been the case, but regardless, for hundreds of millions of years, now just imagine that, hundreds of millions of years, dinosaurs roamed the earth. Hundreds of millions of years is so much longer than we as a human species have even been around that we can almost not even conceive of the amount of time 
And yet that entire uh, range of species, I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of dinosaur species, whew, wiped out. And many of them went, didn't go extinct because of the meteor strike. Many of them went extinct naturally before that. So over the course of those hundred million years, lots of the species that came into being and then just disappeared. We don't even know what our own human species is, going, how long we're going to last. We've been around for such a blink of evolutionary time um, that it's very difficult to say that nature is wrong or right uh, with uh, the way it, it conspires, I suppose. It was the, it's kind of giving nature some kind of a consciousness, but let's just use it anyway. The way that nature conspires to bring some species into existence and take others out. And whether you call it nature, you call it God, you can call it whatever you like. Um, it's happened with, with and without us throughout the course of time. It's a lovely debate to have, and I really do enjoy talking to all of you about it. So if you have any more questions or theories or comments, go ahead. Let's talk about it. We're going to go down Hyena Road now, and then towards Bifflesook Dam. Uh, I know Byron has been there today, but we do know that those dogs move around a huge amount, and so maybe they'll pop across a little bit later. And there were two packs of dogs. One of them is now sitting at First Rock on Torchwood. We don't know where the other pack is, so maybe we'll be very lucky. Looks like another young bull on his own, but this is one's much younger. And he's also in quite close proximity. No, there's some more off to the left. He's in quite close proximity to Viam's very favorite animal. Viam, you must be so excited that we're about to see your favorite animal just before you go on leave. A no, not a leopard, um, a giraffe. I don't see it. It's all, I know you're pretending not to see it. No, I really don't see it. Uh, it's, over the, it's over the top to the right. He says he really doesn't see it, everybody. We, it's, be, it's behind this sort of fallen bush. We'll go and have a look at it shortly. Okay. It's behind there somewhere. That's all VM's prepared to show you. So there's a young bull. There's another few up to the left-hand side. I don't know if it's a herd or perhaps a group of young bulls, but this youngster's a little bit young to be on his own. The day has warmed sufficiently for me to take my jacket off now, so that's what I'm going to do while you look at that elephant. Good question, Sheila. I'm going to say no. You say, do elephants get mange? I don't think they do. And I don't think they do because they don't have hair follicles. And it, well, they don't. They have very few hair follicles. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the mites get into the hair follicles. So I'm going to say no, they don't get mange. These ones certainly don't seem to have any obvious signs of mange. Nice view of the spine there. Oh, there are the hair follicles. Well spotted, Vian. So you can see very sparse hair. And while maybe one or two, oh, thank you, one or two mites might get in there, I don't think it causes much, much damage at all. They also don't have sweat glands of any kind. And uh, that's why they're not so affected by ticks. That's one of the reasons they're not so affected by ticks. They have a very, of course, thick skin, which makes it very difficult for ticks to get into the, into the skin and suck out the blood. Vim, have you given any further thought to what you're going to um, dress up as for Halloween this evening? He's going to grow up uh, as a mushroom. Okay, he's going to dress as a mushroom, everybody. Uh, that should be quite fascinating. Unfortunately, he will be on leave, and so it's unlikely we'll be able to see VM dressed as a mushroom. Although, VM, I must confess, the way you brushed your hair yesterday was a bit mushroomish. 
And VM says it does it all by itself. I suppose those of us who don't have hair are not allowed to make comments about those who do. Uh, Marianne, you've got a qu another question about elephants, which I'm afraid I missed on account of the fact that I was thinking about VM's haircut. Ah, are you worried about whether they eat poisonous plants and how they know that the plants are poisonous? Marianne? Um, they know f probably for two reasons. Firstly, they taste um, poisonous plants and they would choose not to eat them. And secondly, they learn from their parents, from their mothers and aunts in the herd. I think there's a huge amount of mentorship and um, if it's not actual physical discussion, it's certainly demonstration as to what to eat and when to eat it and why to eat it. I think they do self-medicate. There's certainly some evidence to suggest that. And so if they know what plants are good for them to eat, I suspect by default they would therefore know what plants are not good for them to eat. In the same way that your body knows what's poisonous for it. I mean, bar something like an addiction, and of course many of us are addicted to things like sugar, uh, bar something like an addiction like that, your body is very aware of what it wants to eat and what it doesn't. If you are presented with uh, a table full of cakes and sweets and in fact children are the best example of this if you put kids into a room for, uh, and on one uh, sort of one table you've got meat and veg and healthy things and on the other table you've got cakes and sweets initially the kids will rush into the room and they'll just devour all of the confectionery and the sweets and the sugary things but if you keep doing it day after day eventually they leave that start to leave that alone completely because their bodies tell them what they need to eat and I think it's very much the same as with elephants and any other animal around of course they don't have plants out here that they get addicted to simply because there aren't sort of um, they don't have synthetic foods they've only got natural foods here and I think they're very aware of what they, what's good for them and what isn't. All righty, let's have a look at the giraffe, Liam. Are you excited? He's jumping up and down with excitement, everybody. He can barely contain himself. There it is, Liam. There you are, Liam. Luckily for you, we're going to have a very quick look at this deeply aged giraffe. I don't think that the skin disease that giraffe's got is mange. They get uh, something called parafilaria, and I think that's what that is. And so it's not very itchy, and all giraffes get it. Right, very old giraffe. Let's head to Byron, who is not a giraffe, he's not a buffalo, and he's looking at some termites. Look at this, everybody. Look what I've managed to find. A little termite. This is one of the soldier termites. And you can have a look. These are very, very big. Look at the size of this termite compared to my finger. Very, very large. And look at those sharp pincers that you can see. And they use that to protect the colony. So against any any danger, any threat, hey, it's probably going to try and bite me, <laughs> and it's amazing, and I've done it with guests a number of times, and if you get a long strand of hair, and what I would do is get the guests to hold their hair and hold it very tight, and you hold this termite and you put the hair between those pincers, and it snips it and it cuts it completely clean like a knife so sharp they literally close and it cuts it it's really really neat to see now what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you where i found this little guy follow me over here we've got a very very active little termite mount and i'm going to put him back in there off you go there we go and this is all new this is all brand brand new and so there was a bit of movement of these termites around here earlier and they they look to be calming down there's not as much movement but what i find so fascinating and the, all these little soldiers were around the edge of the 
of the um, of the termite mound and around the entrances and probably just protecting it. Some were building, but usually it's the the workers that come and build and will fix this termite mound. So all of this has probably been built by the by the workers. And what that is, it's a mixture of their saliva, their feces, and the soil that they've then dug up and they use that to to make this termite mount. But what's incredible is as I got here, we had all these little soldiers walking around and they do this a very interesting behavior. It's it's almost like a rattling where they stop and they shake and they go tss, tss, and that all creates energy and warmth and um, it's a way for them to communicate with each other too within the termite mound. It is fascinating. Now what happens is through thermoregulation, so the movement and all the activity within the mound from the termites, they create warmth and they create heat. And this mound has then got chimneys. And there's a chimney and they, these chimneys branch out and there's a main chimney over here. And what happens is this allows air to circulate through the mound. And by doing this, they regulate the temperature. Now, it's a pity you can't feel, but if I put my hand in there, I can feel warmth coming out of this termite mound. This mound is probably about 32 to 34 degrees Celsius, which is very, very warm. And just by doing this, I can feel the heat actually coming out and against my hand on both sides. Here especially, wow, it's very warm coming out of this main chimney. And you can see the heat coming out. So I think what's happening is they've opened this on purpose to try and cool the mound down a bit. So they're allowing this hot air to escape and to move out of the mound and get cooler air to move through it. That really was fascinating. And it's incredible how quickly all these, all these uh, soldier termites have disappeared. They've moved back down into the mound. But I'm so glad I got to show you one of them. That really was fa fascinating and lovely to see an active termite mound like this. All right. It's so interesting to be able to see these little creatures and these little animals around while we're out on our safari. And I find it is so important to to stop and appreciate them because they form a crucial role in the ecosystem. Termites get rid of all the dead and decaying plant material, so they are very, very important. Oh, what have we got here? A little dung beetle, everybody. Look at that. <laughs> that dung ball is not very big I'm not sure if that uh, again I'm not sure if it's a male or a female but if that little dung beetle is going to try and impress a female it's probably a male riding that ball I think he's going to have to get a bigger ball it's incredible to watch how they how persistent they are and how strong they are to roll these dung balls up these little hills and into an area where it will probably bury that ball and then feed on that dung. Very interesting. Dark Tranquility asked a question about the termites. She wanted to know are all the workers are female. Now, um, as far as I know, I don't think so. I think it's I think they're male and female. Uh, I'm just trying to think now if I haven't heard. You know what, I, I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to say they're definitely um, all male or all female. I think they are both. I think it's male and female. With the workers, the soldiers, I think, are all males. Um, and then you obviously have the queen, which is probably about that size. The queen termite, which looks almost like a grub. And she's about that size, and all she does is lays eggs. She's long and thin and, and usually white in color. Very, very big. She just lays thousands of eggs daily. And then the workers basically take those eggs and they'll take them into chambers within their termite mound. And the reason for that is they then incubate them on these little layers, these shelves, which are um, built specifically for the incubation of the eggs. And it's incredible 
I understand that there's the communication through pheromones and, and or chemical communication between the termites. The, fe the female who lays the eggs, and actually this is a this is why I, th I think it's male and female for, for workers and for soldiers. But through chemical communication, the termites will let the female know, the queen, they will let her know how many termites are in the colony and what is needed. Are there more soldiers needed or are there more workers needed? And she will then lay eggs and change the chemical makeup of those eggs slightly and that will determine whether or not those termites that hatch become um, soldiers or if they become workers. Isn't that incredible? It's fascinating. I think sometimes, you know, nature really is mind-blowing and it is incredibly interesting to see and try and understand it. And all that is just by, by communication within the, within the colony. So it really is fascinating. I can see every little termite mound we drive past at the moment seems to be a bit of activity. And with that, uh, that uh, dung beetle rolling that ball, and the other day we saw how a female actually holds on to the dung ball while the male rolls it away. We saw it yesterday afternoon. And uh, Ladybug for Daisies would like to know, uh, do the females ever get, ever get dizzy? And I don't think so, I don't think so. But what I have noticed, and it's interesting to watch the males roll the balls, and as they roll them, Every now and then the male will stop, he'll climb to the top of the ball and he walks around like this. And what they're doing is they're orientating themselves and they use the sun mainly. So they'll orientate themselves to know which direction they're going. I don't know why they, they choose a specific direction, I really don't. But I think it's to make sure they're possibly going in the same direction, that they're not walking around in circles. So every now and then they'll stand up, orientate themselves and off they go again. still a lovely cool morning it's really really fantastic to have these cool mornings we know how hot it can get out here yeah? so this is very very welcome all we need is the rain now we need some big storms to come and shower this land with water that would be wonderful So Tom is a new viewer and welcome to you Tom. Great to have you with us on Safari Live. Tom wants to know where we are. So Tom, we are in South Africa and we are situated right up in the northeastern corner in an area known as the Greater Kruger National Park. And within and around the Kruger National Park, there are a number of private land areas and private game reserves. And we are in the Sabi Sands on a property called Juma. And that's where we're situated at the moment. So this entire area, hang on, there's a wildebeest off to our right. There we go, some wildebeest. That's great. So Tom, this area that we are in, the Greater Kruger National Park or Greater Kruger Park is about 3.2 million hectares. So almost 7 million acres of land. And part of it does extend into Mozambique and Zimbabwe. It's little sections where fence free so the animals can move wherever they like. They are completely free to move and cover this area. There is obviously a perimeter fence just around um, to protect the people that live outside in communities and to protect animals. But most of these animals never even see a fence because it is such a vast, vast area. It's bigger than than most or some countries, in fact.
Nice to see those wildebeest walking around looking for some grass to feed on. And I really enjoy just driving around like this with you and bumping into animals. And you can see what a safari is like. And if you were out here with us on the vehicle, it would be exactly the same. I was about to say, often with the wildebeest, you do see zebra with them, and there are zebra just off to the right. There we go, look at that, and the reason for that is just the zebra and the wildebeest are both grazers, and they are often referred to as plains game. They enjoy the open grasslands, and we know in East Africa you get those herds of millions of animals, and James was up there recently, you saw the herds of zebra and wildebeest often together in the same area, mixing and mingling. It's just because they feed on the same vegetation and the herbivores don't mind having each other around because for safety they will alert each other if there's any danger or potential danger. beautiful animals, the Birchall's zebra. All right, we're going to carry on, see what else we can find for you. Let's head back to James, see what he's up to. Has he found anything for you? I'm not sure. I'm still trying to extricate myself, everybody, off Hyena Road, which is very bumpy indeed. We haven't made it just yet to Beefles Hook Dam. Shortly we will. Did you ask Byron to do his um, zebra impression when you he saw the zebra? Because if you didn't, you really should. It's very good. I think that was a good uh, zebra impression, Wilde Wildebeest. Oh, uh, yes. You did? Yeah, maybe the pitch is a bit wrong, but I don't think. You thought the pitch was a bit wrong? Yeah. What was it, too high? Too low. Too low? I think it needs to be higher. Yeah, yeah I'll do it once more. <laughs> yes? Yeah, now he's nodding, everybody. I've got VM's approval. No one else's approval do I need. Louise has given me 8 out of 10. That's because Louise is clearly not listening to me through speakers that are of any value whatsoever. She was listening to me through good speakers. She'd know that it was at least a 9.5 out of 10. There, everybody. This is my first excuse to get out of the car for you today. <laughs> should be able to see it from there. Let me try and unplug myself. There we go. Uh, always search to see if something isn't lurking in the bushes to eat you or put a horn in you. Nothing. And behold the morning glory. Can you see it, Vim? It's the first one I've seen this year. An annual flower. It'll pop up for a little while and then it'll disappear again until next year. Isn't that nice? Beautiful. There are ants all over it, which tells me that it's close to the ground like this and this color because it obviously attracts the, whatever species of ant it is that comes inside, uh, takes out the pollen and takes it to the next morning glory for fertilization. But I'm sure that's why it's so close to the ground. Then, I don't know if you can see over here, Vimpy. Can you see me here? Well, you can see me, obviously. Can you see on the ground here? He's put his thumb up to say, yes, he can. There is the beginnings of a hibiscus cannabinus. 
and I always have a little bit of a laugh at this particular flower, of course, because, well, to say the word cannabis on live stream is very naughty indeed. <laughs> but the hibiscus cannabinus is called hibiscus cannabinus because this leaf apparently, look, I'm told, obviously, I don't know myself, this leaf apparently looks a little bit like a cannabis leaf. Viam shrugging his shoulders also. He has no idea what I'm talking about. Do you, Viam? None whatever. Right, let us continue to Beefle's Hook Dam. Plug myself in so that Louise can give me instructions. There we are. Ooh, quickly to Byron. I think he's got lions. Okay, everyone, I've just heard some kudu alarm calls. And I'm sure there's a leopard in this area somewhere. Let's have a look. We need to scan very, very carefully. Stay with us, because it'll be great if we find her while you are with us. Just trying to maneuver through the bush while I do this. Oh dear, it's not always easy to do this. Have you got it? There we go. Oh, there they are. There they are, everyone. Looks like a young, le hang on. There's one, two, three. Everyone, I think this is Karula. I think this is Karula with her two cubs. Oh, fantastic. Yes. <laughs> finally, finally we found you some leopard. Or well, I found you some leopard. It is indeed, it is indeed. Look at that. Oh, wow, this is wonderful, everyone. Have a look. We haven't seen this female for for a few days. Oh, quite some time, actually. Oh, wow. Look how big they are. I haven't seen them since June. They really are so big. And they're doing very well, it looks like. Okay, let's follow her. I'm just going to try and maneuver through here. Isn't this exciting, everyone? Wow, this is fantastic. I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so excited. Finally, I get to find Leopard. And well, I mean, not just me. Dave spotted her. I just heard the alarm calls. And it's so in interesting, you know, I always speak about this, the importance of listening out to the bush and listening out for, for other animals and their alarm calls. I'm just gonna go around here. Sorry, everyone, it's quite thick. Watch out, Dave. And um, it's so important to listen out for these alarm calls so that we're able to, to work out where the predators are. And these kudu were all staring in this direction. So it made it a bit easier for us to know where to look. They're still moving through there. Sorry everyone, this is a bit thicker than expected, but we'll get to see her again shortly. Uh, can't squeeze through there. You've almost got to anticipate which, which line you take. Oh, but there you see. I know James refers to Karula as the queen. And the two little cubs, <laughs> the prince and princess, I believe he calls them. <laughs> James. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, yeah, have a look, everyone. This is a lovely view, quickly, of them right close to us. Okay, 
see quickly. Watch out. Just watching all these branches. Just going to radio some of the other guides and just let them know where we've got Karula. I'm sure they'd all love to see her. And it might make it easier for us to also stay with her if someone else comes and joins. James um, and Lex, if you copy, uh, located Karula plus two. Um, the animal is mobile north and east in the block from between Gowrie Main, Balanites, and Rebecca's. Um, she's mobile north and east. Okay, copy. I'll update you again once I leave these animals. Copy. Sure, you can see how difficult it is to follow them through here, but they seem, seem quite relaxed with us, which is great. And again, I'm just, I'm keeping my distance a little bit, everyone. I don't want to, I don't want to drive right up behind them because I don't want to disturb them too much or cause them to feel threatened by the vehicle. But we are making a bit of a noise, but we can see she's still very comfortable. Look at that. Oh, this is very, very special. I do, um, I do really, really, really enjoy leopard and I've been fortunate to work in areas and oh, I mean for five years I got to see leopards almost daily leopard viewing where I used to work was really really good and um, and got to learn a lot about these animals which I find very very fascinating I do find leopards fascinating their behavior and what I have noticed too is that it doesn't matter what you read about leopards you'll often find their behavior changing. Uh, all depends on the situation and where they are. It would be nice if she did move out into a slightly more open area for us. Might get a bit better. There we go. Sure, not always easy following these animals. Oh, look there, everyone. Straight ahead. Ah, oh, that is wonderful. But, uh, if I guess right, it looks like the male. Yeah, that is the male with the female, with uh, with Karula, and then it is the young female who's off to the left. And it's incredible. I can already see a size difference between that young male and the young female. And all of this started just after the termites and the zebra. And we stopped to have a look around at something else. And the next thing we heard is the kudu alarm calling. James is saying that young male is almost as tall as the female as his mother. You're right, James. That is very, very interesting. It's incredible how big they get, you know. And just remember that with uh, with the leopards, the young or the males will be twice the size of females. A big male will weigh around 70 to 80 kilograms, whereas a female will only be around 30 to 40 kilograms. So the males are twice the size. So you can imagine these youngsters from a young age, already start looking in a similar size to the females. But I still think these cubs are still very young. So I'm actually, those of you who do know them a bit better than what I do, how old are these cubs now? Can maybe one of our viewers can please let me know 
because I can't remember uh, from the last time I saw them. I think last time I saw them, they must have been about three months. Are they, are they about eight months? They look about eight months, maybe nine months old. Oh, well, look at that. <laughs> so they're about nine months on the 2nd of November, apparently. Uh, that's nice if I look at animals, gauge the, the age, and <laughs> right. I do enjoy that. <laughs> okay, so they're about nine months, nine months old. That's wonderful. So they've still got a little bit of, a little bit of time ahead of them where they're still vulnerable and still have to be careful of other predators. Um, well, I have seen leopards in the past, youngsters about this age or even close to a year and still don't make it. But I do think this Karula, from what I have seen and heard, she's a very successful mother. So I think she'll, she's done very well in raising two cubs. It's not easy for a leopard to raise cubs and for her to raise two is just wonderful. If they go now. There we go. Yeah, I got a very interesting question, but I didn't quite copy all of it. Um, so I'd like that question again because it was an interesting question about related leopards. So Matthew from Michigan. Okay, Matthew's asked us, will if a adult female, so for example, if Karula lost her life, if she was injured somehow, lost her life, and she had two cubs, but a related female came into the area and found the cubs, would she then look after the cubs and raise them as her own? So the chances are highly unlikely, Matthew, but what I have seen in the past, so and I have seen this, so that's why I say, I've been very fortunate to see a lot of different leopard behavior. And um, I've seen, sorry, just trying to get through this. I've seen an, an adult female, an old female, that gave birth to a leopard and raised that leopard. And she then, and oh no, she gave birth, <laughs> she gave birth to, um, to, uh, to, to a cub. And what happened was the female, that young female, actually then left her cub. And the old female, the mother, then took over that, uh, raising that cub, and she raised it. So that has happened before, but uh, not because the female lost her life, but uh, I, purely I think that the young female wasn't ready to look after that cub. It would be wonderful is if these leopards could move out of this area, make it a bit easier for us. I just got a little branch to the face, and we might need danger pay, I think. <laughs> everyone I'm going to try and stick with Karula and move through this thicket while I do that let's quickly get an update from James I think he's got some bovine he'd like to show you oh yes we are with some buffalo but most importantly I think we are also with a very large flock of wattled starlings which were making a lovely noise around here they've got beautiful swizzling call which they have ceased to make so let me try and play it for you on my bird application uh, just enjoy quickly the buffalo while i try and find the starling starling yes 
this correct? None of those ones. Here we go. That's not the call I was hearing. They make a nice whistling call as well. There. Oh, they're starting to fly around now. They're on the top of the tree there. There we are. There, 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 there. Did you hear that? That whistling call? That's the call that I heard. There, now they're making it. That's them making it. That's not the phone. Very cool. Right, back to the beefaloes. They're a small herd of them, probably about 50 or so, which is really not a big herd at all. And... I must confess, I think they've many of the textbooks, textbook assumptions I've made have been thoroughly challenged this year by the behavior of the animals. <clears throat> in theory, what happens with buffalo herds is that in the winter, as the food becomes more concentrated and the water becomes more concentrated, so the herds become bigger. Now, what happened this year, I think, because food became so sparse, and so concentrated in such tiny areas, I think you find that the herds got bigger, certainly, and then they split into much smaller groups as things got more and more desperate. Because the areas where there were food were simply not big enough to support all of the animals. And I think we're seeing the back end of that now. now. The big herds haven't quite congregated yet. And I remember Brent saying when I got back about a week ago, uh, not a week ago, about four days ago, um, him saying to me that the herds, there were sort of a, a number of small herds on the reserve. And, you know, normally you've got one big herd either here or not here. And he said there were three or four herds of 50 or so, which was quite unusual. All righty, let us press on from here. I'm very pleased Karula has come back to see us. That's marvelous news indeed. move on we might get one more look wattled starlings are everywhere oh there's an elephant with the buffalo it's quite nice hello elephant no need to get ornery it's very cool lots and lots of animals going on here buffalo to the right Elephant in front, elephant to the left. Let me just try and sneak slightly further forward. not ideal that's me getting a little bit close sorry about that elephant I do apologize I didn't mean to frighten you in fact it was the very last thing I wanted to do yes well I do hope you'll accept my apology I know you've turned your back on me and shaken your head well I suppose that's fair enough we've also Viem, we've got the elephant there then we have a buffalo just to the right and then, of course, we are just beyond the buffalo, what else do we have? Um, I don't know. Yes, a giraffe. Well done. Your very favorite. They all come out to see you just before you go on leave. You see, they miss you terribly when you're away from here. There's another elephant just about to cross the road there. I'm just doing to do a quick communications test with the final control. Louise, are you still there? Oh, phew. She is still there. You know, when you don't hear her sultry tones in your ear for a while, you start to worry. There they go. Now, I think these are all young bulls, actually. Hmm. 
Hello, Judy. You're wondering if I cleverly disguised myself as a safari guide for Halloween or if I have just foregone the celebration of Hallow's Eve. Uh, well, you see, it's not quite Hallow's Eve just yet here. So um, this afternoon I shall be in my full costume. I don't know what I'm going to be, Judy H. I could get a pith helmet, yes. Oh, and uh, Louise says I should be a plover. That, of course, is on account of the fact that I have legs like a plover's. Thank you, Louise, for reminding me of that. You know, Louise, in our culture, it used to be that you respected people who are as old as I am now. <laughs> Lily B, you've made a very hilarious joke. Uh, you said Vim is going to be a mushroom, a.k.a. a fun guy. I get it. Yes. Yes. We're going to leave these elephants and their buffalo. Nice herd of elephants. We might come back here this afternoon, I think. There was just some pressure from other vehicles behind, so we're just going to keep moving now. All right, everybody, we've got a little bit longer of drive, and I think you'd probably rather spin it with Karula than have me waffling at you. So let's head back across to her. Thank you for your wonderful drive this morning. I've had a great time with you, and thanks for talking to us. Join us today at half past three, and we'll see what we can find during the sunset. Goodbye, Viam. Goodbye. We're still with Karula, everyone. We've managed to follow her through this thick bush with the cubs, but we're approaching a road now, so I'm hoping they decide to walk along the road for us. That would be wonderful. Hang on. I'm going to try to get us a view here quickly. We're going to get them crossing the road shortly. Nice out in the open. Let's see where they go. I'll watch these little cubs. They've been a little bit playful. Three leopards, everyone. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I'm so happy. I promise you, I, you can't, I can't even begin to explain. It's just such a lovely, lovely sighting. And to be able to spend time with them and follow them. There we go. Out in the road. Stay along the road. No. <laughs> a young male. Oh dear. The keys seem to be stuck. Sorry everyone, Rusty seems to be fighting at me now. She got stuck and wouldn't turn. All right, well, don't worry, got it going. She's still moving through this very thick stuff. I actually might lose her soon. Hang on a second. I think I found a little gap here. Winter Prism would like to know how many litters might each of these big cats have in a lifetime. Now, if I'm not, it, it all depends. So there are a number of factors that go into it because what could happen is a female might give birth to something and then potentially lose lose her cubs to for whatever reason. And so I would say. Uh, Hang on a second, Karula spotted something, everyone. Um, 
So the average lifespan of a female leopard is probably, let's call it 17 years. She'll probably only give birth for the first time around three, three years old, maybe three to four years. And then every two years after that, so let's call it three, then five, then seven, uh, I'll call it nine, eleven, you know what, six or seven times, eight times in, life, in their lifespan, if they're lucky, if they're very successful, I would say somewhere around there for leopards and lions, maybe a bit less, maybe five or six times. She definitely saw something, but the little cubs carried on moving. They were not worried at all. I'm just going to try to stay with a few more minutes for you. Branches are not fun to drive through. I wonder what Karula saw because she she actually ran a little bit. Mm. Just See where they're going. Watch, watch out there, Dad. Can you still see them? No, oh, there they are. They're just behind us. Okay, hopefully they come out into this opening. Here we go, everyone. She's walking towards us. What a way to end. Um, everybody, don't forget to join us again this afternoon, and we'll hopefully have more of this leopard and the lions. Thank you to David on camera, the ladies in FC, Lou and Kirsten. Thank you very much. Thanks to James. Thank you again to all our viewers. It is wonderful to have you on safari with us. Thank you for the comments. We will see you all this afternoon. Enjoy your day or evening wherever you are. Thank you, everybody, and what a way to end.